In this video, we'll be looking at how to carry out the required practical for photosynthesis. Now, this practical involves measuring the effects of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis. The apparatus that we'll be needing, I've set out in front of you, a ruler, stopwatch, sodium hydrogen carbonate, a torch or a light source, a beaker filled with water, a test tube or a boiling tube, um, we've got a funnel down there as well and then some pondweed. The pondweed is what we'll be photosynthesizing. Um, now in terms of this apparatus I've already set up, the reason that we have a beaker filled with water is because often when we use a light source like a lamp for example, um, they can actually release some heat or thermal energy as well as the light energy. Now we want to avoid this because we only want to investigate the effects of light intensity. So therefore the beaker filled with water acts as a sort of barrier and ensures it's just light intensity having an effect. Then I also added some sodium hydrogen carbonate to this um, setup with the water, um, the pondweed and etc. The reason for this is because the sodium hydrogen carbonate solution will actually provide the pondweed with some carbon dioxide and this will ensure that carbon dioxide does not become a limiting factor and again allows us to just investigate the effect of light intensity. Um, the test tube that I've got at the top here will allow me to count the oxygen bubbles that the pondweed will produce more easily. So what I need to do initially is to leave my setup like this with the light um, in front of my beaker and pondweed to allow the pondweed some time to acclimatise itself to its surroundings. So I will turn on my torch and leave it at whichever distance I'm going to start with. So that is 10 in this case, so 10 centimetres. I would leave it like this and I need to make sure that I turn off any other light sources that I have in the room, so such as um, ceiling lights and then I'd make sure to close the blinds as well. So I'll do that now, leave this for a few minutes and then we'll get started. You'll notice that it's gone a little bit dark and that's because I've turned off all of my light sources. So um, we're going to get started now and we're going, we're going to see um, how the light intensity again has an effect on the rate of photosynthesis by measuring the distance from 10 centimetres. So I'll start the stopwatch. One thing to note is that um, an issue that you can kind of be faced with with this experiment is that it's kind of difficult to um, measure or see the number of oxygen bubbles produced accurately. And that's um, one reason for that is because bubbles will be produced or released at a rapid rate so it's hard to count them all in one go so let's say you have 80 bubbles it is going to be quite difficult to count them all you might not get the exact number correctly another problem is that the bubbles wouldn't be the same size um, generally speaking so you might have one really large bubble then another smaller bubble but then you've counted them both as being equivalent so one way to get around this would be to potentially use a gas syringe and with the gas syringe you'll be able to actually measure um, the exact volume of oxygen gas produced more accurately. Um, I think has it been a minute? Yeah, it's been nearly a minute. We'll just stop the stopwatch there. And then what I would have to do after that is make sure that I repeat this experiment from 10 centimetres at least three times and then I can get a mean result from there. Just makes it easier to rule out any anomalous results, um, any that kind of stick out. Then I would repeat the experiment at different distances. So I've done it at 10 to start with initially. Um, obviously I'd count the number of bubbles, record it in a suitable results table and then I would um, measure it three times again well two more times after the first one do it from a different distance so then the next one would be 20 again um, wait a minute record the result repeat it twice and then do it from the next distance which would be about 30 and then 40 etc um, until I have um, kind of a range of distances covered and that should cover you for this required practical I will go through how to analyze the data now so before we actually go into um, trying to interpret data from a photosynthesis required practical, um, I thought I would just leave up the steps that we took and why we took them, um, which I did mention earlier on in the video on this screen, just so that you have a reference point. What I want you to do now is have a go at answering the question at the bottom of the screen. What are the independent, dependent and control variables? Pause the video here and have a go and then we'll go through the answers. 
OK, so the independent variable in this case would have been what we changed. So that would have been the distance of the light source from the pond read each time. The dependent variable is what we key is what we measure. So what did we measure during the practical? We measured the number of oxygen bubbles produced per minute. Now, in terms of control variables, there was a couple that you could have had. You could have mentioned the temperature of the water. So in our case, we used a beaker of water in front of the plant and that allowed um, the kind of it allowed you to stop um, heat from interfering in the experiment because the beaker absorbed any thermal energy, but it did allow light to pass through. Another thing that you could have maybe mentioned was the mass of the plant. So um, during the experiment, we use the same piece of plant each time for each repeat, for each different distance, and that just keeps everything fair. This set of data has been um, collected from a required practical that someone has carried out. So what can we notice? Well, there's a number that's clearly circled in red. And the reason for this is that this number is an anomaly or an anomalous result. If you look at the other two repeats for that 15 centimeter um, distance, we can see that they're quite similar, 88 and 88. However, 65 stands out like a sore thumb. So we circle it and we ignore it because it is an anomaly. So when we calculate our mean, we don't take that into account and we would simply add up 88 and 88 and then divide by 2 rather than 3 because we have ignored that middle result. So in terms of if we were to put that, those results into a graph, we can see that as the lamp position increases, the number of bubbles per minute actually decreases. So the reason for this would be that as the lamp position is increasing, the light intensity is actually decreasing. Yeah. So if the lamp is obviously closer, that means we've got a higher light intensity. If the lamp is further away, we've got a lower light intensity. And we can see that the number of bubbles per minute is linked to this. So therefore, as a light intensity um, decreases, we know that the rate of photosynthesis would also decrease because the number of bubbles per minute is actually telling us kind of how um, effectively or how fast the plant is photosynthesizing. This part is important for those of you who are doing higher tier. Um, as we stated previously, as the lamp, di lamp distance from the pond would increases, the light intensity decreases. Now, this links into something called the inverse square law, which states that lamp distance and light intensity are actually inversely proportional to each other. So it can be represented by this formula, which shows light intensity. Um, this is the proportional sign um, and it's equal to or not equal to is proportional to one divided by distance squared. So I'll show you how that looks with um, some data plugged in. So in this case, if we were to, let's use this example, 15 centimetres, if we wanted to calculate what the light intensity would be proportional to, we would do 1 divided by 15 squared and we would get 0 0.0044 arbitrary units or AU. So that's an answer to two significant figures. I want you to see if you can pause the video and use that example to help you calculate these three figures as well. OK, so this is what you should have got as your answers. Each time is really simple. All you're doing is one divided by the distance and then squaring it each time. And you should have got these answers. Thanks for watching, guys.